Welcome to Vigilant News for January 31st, 2022. I'm Justin, founder of Stones in the Storm, and I'm joined by my co-host, Ryan DeLarm, founder of Underground Newswire. Ryan, how are we doing today? Doing good, Justin. Thanks for having me. Got a great news week and lots of awesome stuff we got moving here forward. Before we get into some of that, this news we're going to be covering today is the Occupy Ottawa Day 2 massive freedom rally happening, as I'm sure you a lot of you have heard of. We've got some awesome footage we want to show you. We've got Marjorie Taylor Greene blasting Lindsey Graham. Joe Rogan finally responding to the Spotify scandal or shenanigans related to people wanting to leave. His response is really awesome, and I want to check it out with you guys, so stay tuned for that. We have CNN blasting Rogan listeners, essentially calling them idiots. Pelosi family is steeped in uh, business deals with China, and BLM is suffering massive scandal. Turns out spending money to actually help the Black community isn't something the founders are too interested in. Go figure. And we got a bunch of rapid fire news. Before we get started with that, don't forget to check the description. We have still have our pine pollen promotion. Remember, that's only got a few days left. So if you haven't already picked up your pine pollen, definitely get yourself some. You can get 10% off. Not only that, but everything you order with your first order. And we have um, uh, our uh, donation link. So stillnessinthestorm.com forward slash donate. We can go to support our work where you need all the help we can get because... We're getting shadow banned like crazy. Why don't yeah. you tell the audience? Well, especially Underground Newswire, we just got a 90-day uh, shadow ban. Uh, our reach has dropped by like 90%. So, you know, if you feel it so inclined, I would appreciate it if you, you know, spread the word if you can. If not, it's no big deal. But we love yeah. you anyway. Yeah, it's, it's the sharing of news. If it really, if it wasn't for people taking it upon themselves to share the news that they value with the people that they want it to know the alt media wouldn't exist in the modern age. So it really helps not only just underground newswire, but all the news you get out there from alternative sources. So, yeah. And I mean, regardless, we're just going to keep doing it anyway. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're not going to take this line down. So with that, let's get into probably one of the most inspiring stories for today. Yeah, we were watching uh, last night. There was a lot of footage coming out of, in, uh, from Ottawa in Canada, where I'm sure you all know exactly what's going on there. So, Occupy Ottawa Day 2, we're just getting started, is the top of the headline here. The Trucker Freedom Convoy to Ottawa, Canada, entered its second day today with no signs that things were to be slowing down. I have periodically checked in on live streaming throughout the day. I have heard people on the ground in Ottawa state things like, they think they're all going home now, but we're just getting started. <laughs> uh, there was a stage set up in downtown Ottawa this morning where local pastors and others took turns addressing the crowd. That's awesome. The protests have been remarkably peaceful so far, given the size of the crowds, which even the corporate media admits is in the thousands, probably tens of thousands, I would say. There's at least 50,000 truckers there, and then another 25,000 came the next day. So. Right. But it is probably in the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands. Some people on the ground are estimating up to 2 million people. Wow. Uh, so we got an image there. And yet the corporate media continues to characterize the protesters as radicals and domestic terrorists, even suggesting Russian actors are probably fueling the protests. Oh my God. <laughs> when in doubt, play the Russia card. <laughs> Uh, so this woman here, she's the one who was talking about Russia, you know, uh, we're just going to skip past okay, that. Right. It's infuriating <laughs> and mind numbing. Uh, Justin Trudeau and his family have allegedly been removed from their home due to security concerns. I saw somebody on, uh, I think it was like Reddit or Twitter or some, some saying that he was spotted sledding somewhere in some island. Oh, really? Yeah. Who knows? Uh, ironically, he got COVID out of nowhere being, despite being triple vaxxed. Uh, so now he doesn't have to, you know, address this problem in his country. In some positive news, Scott Moe, the premier of Saskatchewan, a Canadian province that borders the U.S., called for an end to vaccine mandates for the truckers. And he actually released a paper. Looks like uh, today trucker rallies are being held at many locations across the country, including on Parliament Hill in Ottawa and in various communities in Saskatchewan. Here is my message to Saskatchewan and Canadian truckers. And then here, here it is. And you can read it if you'd like. So what's next? The trucker convoy has received widespread support and their supporters have raised millions of dollars to support them to cover the cost of fuel, food, making this appear to be more than just a weekend event and arguably could have been like intensely or like coordinated. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It seems to be happening all over the world, Australia, the, the EU. Yeah. So you need a lot of grassroots support to pull something like that off. So, yeah. 
and the coordination between 50,000 truckers, like some, somebody might have their hand in this. I don't know who. Yeah, but, but they're just a bunch of radicals. So, you know, fringe minority group. Uh, what will happen next? That is the big question facing Canadians and those around the world as they watch what is happening in Ottawa. People are scheduled to return to work tomorrow, Monday morning, including members of parliament. Meanwhile, there won't be many trucks crossing the border between Canada and the U.S., which is sure to exacerbate already stressed supply chain problems. And, you know, there's people out there who are saying, oh, these guys are selfish. You know, they're causing this problem. The problem's already here. Mm -hmm. the, the supply chain issue is here. There's no better time for them to be doing this. Yeah, no kidding. Me. That's a great point. If this drags on into next week, the Canadian government is sure to take action. But just what action will be and whether or not members of the military and RCMP will obey their tyrannical leaders if they ask them to turn on their fellow citizens is yet to be seen. And I always say that they probably wouldn't, whether it's America, Canada, you know, we're not the same, but we're pretty, pretty similar. Precisely. So I, I don't think that day would ever come. I think more likely if they wanted something like that to happen, they would have to get UN troops, you know, to fund all the police and get UN troops in here. And then maybe they could get it to happen, but it's just, I don't know. Yeah. It'd be a lot to ask. I'm fairly certain that they've done studies or evaluations to determine if soldiers would attack their own citizens and it's pretty reluctant. So um, yeah. Looks like we got a video here. Yeah. yeah we got a clip. I pulled uh, this is downtown Ottawa the, during the celebration, the middle of the night last night, oh, there wow. were uh, a bunch of people on the left hand side of the aisle just like raging on the internet like i'm in my apartment i'm gonna kill myself they won't stop honking <laughs> yeah funny because it, this is probably an actual legitimately peaceful protest conversely or in contrast to the quote-unquote peaceful protests of 2020 that were hardly peaceful shift the context if this was uh new year's eve everyone would be happy so yeah that's very true very <laughs> true no one's burning any buildings down you know mm -hmm. so. all right let's take a look Oh, we, we got an ad. Oh, come on. There you go. Yeah, we, we better get, uh, we better get some commission. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See, uh, the entire city is filled with trucks. That's right. Uh, never mind the language on the side of that truck. Oh, right. <laughs> Sorry, folks. I'm having some technical difficulty. There we go. I made it a little bit bigger for you. That's here. probably my bad, the way I embedded it in there. Yeah, so this doesn't seem like a small rabble of people at all. I mean, we got a good chunk of people, and they're well supported. And, you know, one thing I was going to mention while I mention while this is going is that the... Um, it takes a, the amount of money that they've managed to drum up. It indicates the level of support. So, mm -hmm. and then of course you have Trudeau, who is nowhere to be seen, mm -hmm. uh, and just happens to bear an uncanny resemblance to a certain uh, Cuban oh, dictator. Yeah, let's pull that up here. I suppose. Yeah, yeah we're not saying anything conclusively, but uh, there's certainly something to be said here about the. So look at this, ladies and gentlemen. I mean. I'm no, you know, I, I have an affinity for faces. I'm the kind of guy who can, once I see a face, as long as I see it for a couple minutes, I will never forget that face. And I mean that legitimately. I might forget the name associated with the face, but I never forget a face because I've got really good detail and respect, respect to faces. And there's so many striking similarities here. You the know? nose, the smirk, the mouth, the cock head, the way they both sit when they're talking in certain like mm. councils is, is very similar also. Right. Now, does that is that proof that we've got a genetic resemblance? Not necessarily, because there are things called genetic analogous archetypes. So in other words, you can have certain features present themselves within a certain genetic pool, even if they are not related genetically. So homo, homo, homologous, homologous genetic relation is like father to son analogous is two people unrelated genetically so but there is that and then there's also the uh the fact that it is widely believed by many people and talked about throughout the ages about how his mother was perhaps having extramarital affairs with castro and among other people like uh, uh mick jagger etc so right exactly it's not completely out of the question but also neither here nor there right we don't have 100 percent proof but that point you just raised is a pretty good indication yeah. if it's true <laughs> that there might be something to this idea that fidel castro is the father of trudeau and you know if we want to throw in some 
conspiracy theory talk. There is, it is widely believed by many researchers and I'll cite the connection between um, Rockefeller, uh, Podesta and, uh, oh, what's the guy's name from- uh, Zuckerberg? No, the uh, the singer, the rapper from Lincoln Park. Oh, Chester Bennington. Chester Bennington. Yeah, look at the resemblance with those guys. Pretty, you know, pretty uncanny. So it is believed that a lot of illegitimate children from the globalists end up being groomed for positions of power or through influence. various means or influence. Yes. So um, you know, we don't have proof. We don't have one hundred percent certainty, and I'm not presenting it. Nor, nor there's Ryan. But this is all food for thought. We should be able to explore these ideas free of intervention. So, um, all right, well, good story there. I'm really inspiring. Hopefully a lot more stuff comes out about that. Um, well, they said they're just getting started. So I guess we'll see. Yeah. I mean, last Occupy, the one in 2020, or I'm sorry, 2011, that lasted, what, like a summer? Wall like, Street? Yeah. Yeah, I think something like that. Yeah, it was, it was not a short period of time by any means. So um, actually, you know what? I think I'm going to let's let's have you do the the rogan one now because i want to do the cnn after that so uh okay. do you have that pulled up any chance uh oh you don't okay yeah i do now oh you do okay great all right here we go we got thank you to the haters joe rogan breaks silence on spotify controversy rejects disinformation label mm -hmm. uh this was i think coming out of zero hedge Hours after Spotify said in a statement that it would modify its content policies, which Joe Rogan did not violate, and the company clarified that, mm -hmm. uh, and adopt a counter advisory for certain podcast episodes in an effort to placate the snowflakes. <laughs> Joe Rogan finally broke his silence on the uproar over his podcast in a 10 minute video shared on Instagram. In the video, a kind of frank confessional apparently shot by Rogan himself using his own phone, Rogan apologized to those he had unwittingly offended before launching into a poignant, carefully crafted explanation that gently nudged and reminded objectors about why Rogan's show is a must listen and a leader in the modern day podcast gold rush. But first, Rogan asked listeners to ignore certain disparaging headlines that he said misrepresent what he's doing. I want to make this video, first of all, because I think there are a lot of people who have a distorted misconception about what I do, maybe based on sound bites or headlines of articles that are disparaging. The podcast has been accused of spreading dangerous misinformation, specifically about two episodes, one with Dr. McCullough and one with Dr. Malone, which we both highly recommend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> both doctors are highly credentialed while having while harboring views on SARS COVID-2 and how to combat it, there are different, they are different from the mainstream narrative. Both of these people are very highly credentialed, very intelligent, highly accomplished people, and they have an opinion that's different from the mainstream narrative. I wanted to hear what their opinion is, and that's fair enough. Yeah. What is it, a cr thought crime, a thing now? Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Unfortunately, there are others who are fearful of what these two doctors have to say and believe that they are somehow personally responsible for the ongoing COVID <laughs> pandemic, <laughs> despite the fact that the science shows it's quite obvious that there's nothing humans can do to stop the pandemic, although they can take steps to limit fatalities. This is the problem. Since the start of the pandemic, public health authorities have seen their guidance proven wrong again and again, as comedian Adam Carolla put it. We mentioned that, I think, on the last right. stream. Mm -hmm. uh, Rogan says something similar, claiming that practically every piece of misinformation has later been proven correct. <laughs> Everything from whether the vaccinated can still spread the virus to whether COVID may have been created in Wuhan laboratory, uh, a view that once saw a zero hedge banned from Twitter for months. I have also experienced something similar. That's right quote from Joe Rogan. The problem I have with the term disinformation, especially today, is that eight months ago, many of the things that were considered disinformation are now accepted as fact. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. For example, eight months ago, if you said, if you get vaccinated, you can still catch COVID and you can still spread COVID, you would be removed from social media. They would ban you from certain platforms. Now we know that you are probably more likely to catch and spread COVID. Mm -hmm. He continued, eight months or, or a year ago, if you said, I don't think cloth masks work, you would be banned from social media. Now that's openly and repeatedly stated on CNN. 
If you ask, I think it's possible COVID may have come from a lab, you would have been banned from many social media platforms. Now it's on the cover of Newsweek. Again, Rogan insisted that he isn't endorsing the views of his guests, nor proclaiming them to be somehow correct or immutable. He's simply exploring a range of viewpoints to help his audience arrive at their own conclusions. Instead of being indoctrinated with viewpoints favorable to the masters of whatever corporate owned media they consume. I don't know if they're right. No, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a scientist. I'm just a person who sits down with people and has conversations with them. Do I get things wrong? Absolutely. But when I get them wrong, I try to correct them because I'm interested in finding out what the truth is. And I'm interested in having conversations with people who have different opinions. I'm not interested in talking with people who have only one perspective. Rogan then name checked several mainstream COVID experts from Dr. Sanjay Gupta to Dr. Michael Osterholm, a member of President Biden's COVID advisory board, uh, to others as evidence that he is truly interested in hearing a diverse range of opinions and views, and not just those who parrot the government endorsed official narrative. As for the situation with Neil Young, Rogan gamely noted that he's sure there are things that are going on behind the scenes. For example, might Young be doing this to try to fetch a higher price for his lifetime music catalog ahead of a sale, mm. like Bob Dylan did? Uh, but still, Rogan insists that he has always been a huge Neil Young fan, even recounting an amusing story about a Neil Young show when he, that he attended while working concert security in his youth. As for the interviews he conducts with his guests, they are just contra- they're just conversations. Oftentimes, I have no idea what I'm going to talk about until I sit down. That's also the appeal of the show. It's one of the things that makes it interesting. Towards the end of the video, Rogan said this to sum it up. I'm not trying to promote misinformation. I'm not trying to do anything controversial. I'm just trying to have regular conversations with these people. My pledge to you is that I will do my best to balance out these more controversial viewpoints with other people's perspectives so that we can maybe find a better view. I don't just want, I don't just want to just show the contrary opinion to what the prevailing narrative is. I want to show all kinds of opinions so that we can figure out what's going on and not just about COVID, about health, about fitness, wellness, the state of the world itself. And finally, he even thanked the haters for helping him stay sharp. Yeah, I think he just absolutely killed it with this. Um, I was going to try to do like this fancy play it and have us talk over it, but that's not going to happen. Uh, yeah, he, you know, a few things that I think were really important that he delivered so beautifully. First of all, he keeps emphasizing the fact that he's just trying to have conversations with people. Now, put that into context, the whole, not the entire media empire and big tech empires after him, but a good chunk of it, enough to say that he's a threat to the, the, the mainstream narrative, for sure. In merely having open and honest conversations with people is enough to damage the narrative. That's how powerful just having honest conversations can be, which means we, the people, can have the very same type of honest conversations in the style Rogan does, where we're not trying to push anybody's, uh, our view on anybody. We're not trying to make somebody believe what we believe. We're just merely trying to talk about the information. And this is the really amazing thing that I wanted to emphasize, which is that all you have to do, one of the best techniques for sharing the truth is just simply be honest about your thoughts and opinions. Don't try to force truth on people. Just ask them what they think and ask probing questions. Be like, well, if you believe that you know uh, vaccines can't spread COVID, why do you believe that? Did, what did you think about the information related to the fact that vaccines have been demonstrated to have people spread COVID? And you, even if you get a vaccine, it's not going to prevent you from spreading it. You, know, you just start having honest conversations with people and it can do a tremendous, tremendous thing. And even his, his re- response to, you know, I want to have countering opinion, also brilliant, not only from a, an interviewer perspective, because you want to have diverse opinions, but from a strategic perspective, because as far as I'm concerned, and I'll expose my bias, there is, the, the COVID pandemic is a, sh- a sham. It is a fraud, not totally, but it is a fraud. And all that's required is the people with the more true opinions to speak in relation to the people with the less true opinions for the truth to be ferreted out naturally. So um, brilliant. But what did you did you manage to watch the video by any chance? Of Rogan? Yeah. Yeah, the, he, they pretty much laid it all out mm-hmm. in the article. Uh, I would say, though, that it's not like he just had a couple of yahoos on that are like giving disinformation. Dr. Peter McCullough is the most published uh, 
person in his field is epidemiology, I believe. It's probably a couple yeah, of Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, epidemiology. I know. I think cardiology is the thing that he's his field, but in any case, yeah. Uh, and then also Malone, who is part of, was part and res responsible for even developing these mRNA vaccines, knows Anthony Fauci personally. This isn't like just some dude that he found on the street corner, you know, so. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Well, great. Uh, and again, another really inspiring thing. As far as I'm concerned, this is a win for um, the truth and the people because it's it's the method, the method that we need to be using, not just the only method, but one of the methods we need to be using and can use to further advance the truth and it results freedom that comes with it. And then I think that ducktails on something you got going. Right exactly. Here. So now that thank you for covering that. I know I kind of throw a wrench in the gear. No, <laughs> But um, I wanted to, to cover this because I saw this when I was going through the news this morning. And I'm like, wow, these people have exposed <laughs> themselves in a way that is rare and we should not uh, overlook it. So CNN labels Joe Rogan's millions of his listeners as less enlightened than their fellow thousand viewers, or uh, than their few thousand viewers. So C CNN has you know barely any ratings. There's a chart that we actually showed a few weeks ago of CNN compared to Rogan, and Rogan's like blowing them out of He's water. He's like ten times the amount of their highest ranked show, which is Rachel Maddow. That's right. So yeah, Joe Rogan on his worst day just absolutely <laughs> kills it with respect to the CNN. So in a broadcast, virtually no one watched. CNN talking heads and CNN's potato head Brian Selter had a debate about Rogan's podcast causing big problems for Spotify and declared that all of Rogan's millions of listeners are basically idiots. And that's essentially the case. Weasley reporter Oliver Darcy, by the way, you know, I, I, I think these these pejoratives are funny, but I'm not necessarily endorsing that. I just want to make that clear. Um, Oliver Darcy, who will not relent until everything apart from CNN is censored and banned, compared Rogan's audience to fat, unhealthy people who choose to eat junk food rather than stay healthy. <laughs> Yeah, this the, there's the the toxic thinking of what I would call conceptual authoritarians is beautifully laid out here. So a conceptual authoritarian is somebody who doesn't really understand the truth at a personal level. They just believe so much in their chosen truth authority that they think you who dare to question that is literally a threat to them, a threat to their way of life, and a threat to civilization itself. That's the 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 trappings of a truth author or a conceptual authoritarian. So let's go ahead and just watch this clip. It speaks for itself, and I think you'll see what I'm getting at here. Oh, wait. Think about Spotify. You went viral for a comment about it yesterday. Tell us your point of view first about this Spotify mess, because it's really dominated the week. Yeah, you know, what I think is interesting about the backlash against Spotify vis-a-vis -vis Joe Rogan is that... Um, you know, people are fundamentally angry about not being able to stop his audience from wanting news that is bad for them, uh, you know, wanting something that's bad for them. So, you know, we're all haunted by the specter of this guy who's listening to Joe Rogan and internalizing this bad information and making bad choices as a result. But wow. Rogan is like a weed that sprang up outside the mainstream media ecosystem. He thrived there and he has this huge audience. And that's what's really scary. The Okay, I just have to pause it because there's like already three things I want to mention. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so first of all, she's she's relating um, listening to or people who listen to Rogan and Rogan himself as this kind of dissident, this weed. Yeah. You know, which is if you listen to the rhetoric that was used during the Holocaust, what did the media describe the the dissidents as? You know, very similar language here. Okay. And I have total respect for the Holocaust. I'm not a Holocaust denier or anything like that. I'm certainly not an anti-Semite. Um, the other thing she was mentioning here, let me actually back it up. I forgot what she said. That's because it's really dominated the week. Interesting about the backlash against Spotify vis-a-vis -vis Joe Rogan is that... Ah, yes, she, she is describing this man who's listening to Rogan and consuming bad news and you know, could potentially be dangerous. She's discussing a hypothetical. This hypothetical she's talking about, it's a boogeyman. What she's describing is a man, a radical, who is going to be radicalized as a result of listening to this Rogan information and then going to cause harm to other people, namely herself and you know her community, because of the things he's listening to. And it's a known fact that absolutely no woman watches Joe Rogan. <laughs> right. You know, uh, so so yeah, this there's two already, she, the, the amount of fear-mongering and 
the divisive language is really palpable. Let's keep listening. That, um, you know, people are fundamentally angry about not being able to stop his audience from wanting news that is bad for that people uh, uh you mean like it. just you yeah exactly <laughs> like, <laughs> you're like handful of cronies and viewers and yeah stuff. like who is this lady she's i'm not sure uh cat cat rosenfeld whoever that is a uh, twitter person a twitter per- twitter blue check mark somebody who's apparently somebody we should be listening to but uh yeah that's a really good point i mean yeah you know to characterize all of joe rogan's listeners as you know dissidents essentially is is ridic- ridiculous so. and men and yeah and men yeah so let's keep listening it's bad for them so you know we're all haunted by the specter of this guy who's listening to joe rogan and internalizing this bad information and making bad choices as a result but rogan is like a weed that sprang up outside the mainstream media ecosystem he thrived there and he has this huge audience and that's what's really scary that spotify could kick him off tomorrow and it wouldn't make a dent. Nope. It wouldn't make a dent in his audience. People would still listen to him. And crucially, they still wouldn't trust more mainstream media sources. And I think that's what's really, really frightening to people. That's uh, really oh, frightening right. to you, right. sister. That's for sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there it is right there. She's afraid that if people listen to Joe Rogan, they're not going to listen to the mainstream media anymore. You know, And the, the subtext here is that if you don't listen to the mainstream media and you don't believe what the mainstream media and the authoritarians tell you, you might do things that make people uncomfortable. You might do things that might be out of step with the authoritarians. And a good house slave always wants to make sure that everybody else is doing what they're doing because they're in a state of fear. She's in a state of Stockholm syndrome, I would argue, although it's hidden behind many layers of self-aggrandizement. So let's uh, let's keep, let's finish. Wait a minute. Actually, there's... I thought there was more to the clip. Maybe he's going to get into. Yes, I don't even. Oh uh, yeah. All right. Well, let's at least listen to the rest of the the this homeboy right here. People who are uh, listening to this Joe guy, yeah. podcast don't necessarily believe it to be bad information. So uh, there was an analogy drawn between Doritos and Joe Rogan's podcast. Uh, people know that Doritos are not necessarily good for them. Uh, that you're not going to find a nutritional expert who says you know you should eat a lot of Doritos. But there are a lot of people who listen to Joe Rogan's podcast who believe that he's actually the, the truth teller. They, they believe the opposite, that, that Joe Rogan is good for an informational diet. And I think that's what's so important is that the people who are listening to him don't believe it to be bad information. So it, it's difficult, I guess, for them to make that, uh, that choice, that good choice uh, uh, of uh, consuming information when they, they think that the, the, the podcast hosting people with anti-vaccine rhetoric is really the, uh, the truth telling podcast. Kat, you made the Doritos reference. Right. I, I rather liked it. What do you say to Oliver? Um, I mean, I think that it just ultimately comes down to the question of how do you want to solve this, you know, and that's sort of where the analogy comes in, you know, here's people who, you know, they like something that we, you know, consider ourselves more enlightened, don't think is good for them, Um, you know, we think that they're internalizing this misinformation. There you go, there's a little bit more, but that's basically the, the meat of it, that, you know, they're enlightened, they know better than everybody else who doesn't agree with them. So how dare we dare to question their direct line to the the absolute truth you know we'll pray for them yeah exactly seriously <laughs> so quite, quite alarming but you know the, the good news and i always want to put a good spin on things the the nakedness of the intellectual authoritarianism is unpalatable to most people and i think anybody with a lick of common sense a lick of th- critical thinking capacity is going to see that and be like you know what i don't want to continue to imbibe this and that's obviously the more insane bogus stance to take so um yeah that what would you think was it a an entertaining rouse of uh media journalism or i i think it was just like you could be distilled down to like joe rogan bad we good <laughs> listen to us <laughs> or you're gonna die you know like, right it's just absurd and, and those pundits completely embody those kind of folks that are just never gonna get it right and if they would rather like hurl themselves out of the building i think than like accept the, the truth about what's going on here not that we know exactly what the truth is but we know what it's not and we know what cnn's doing we know what the cia is doing we know what all of this is and these people these useful idiots or maybe willfully malicious folks uh i think their days are numbered i agree i think so freedom and critical thinking is on the rise well with that we got a um Next article up, which is the uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene blasts Lindsey Graham after his disgusting and ignorant comments 
supporting January 6th prisoner abuse. And this is coming from the Gateway Pundit. They tend to get, you know, tend to, you know, toss the jabs out, hand oh, yeah. them out. President Trump held another packed rally in Conroe, Texas on Saturday night. An estimated 50,000 supporters wow. turned out to see President Trump in Texas. During his speech, President Trump promised to release the persecuted January 6th political prisoners at the D.C. Gulag. What, in like three years? I know. <laughs> <laughs> These poor men and women are held in isolation without any basic human rights. Truly, this is a dark stain on America and our judicial system. One of many. Mm -hmm. On Sunday morning, Rhino, Lindsey Graham, was asked about President Trump's comments. Lindsey Graham disagreed with President Trump and cheered the unconstitutional prisoner abuse in the nation's capital. That is insane to me. Yeah, no kidding. I don't see the political strategy behind that, but uh, whatever. Here we go. Rep. Mar Marjorie Taylor Greene blasted Lindsey on the war room on, Wednesday, on Monday. Uh, here's a quote from her. Lindsey Graham, he said he hopes the people who've been arrested for January 6th go to jail and have the book thrown at them. But I think what Lindsey Graham needs is to be informed of, since he could care less and hasn't even checked it out himself, is these people have been thrown in jail and are having the book thrown at them, and then some. Actually, they haven't even been to court yet. They have not been convicted of any crime, but they are being held in jail indefinitely in a pretrial state. January 6th defendants are being abused. Treated worse than radical Islamist terrorists. Mm -hmm. And it's true, man. There's stuff coming out every day. There's letters from these people that are coming out to the press, the alternative press mostly, uh, or conservative press. And they're the only ones doing it. And fortunately, people are able to raise money for these folks. But like, who knows if they're getting it, you know? Yeah, it's spot on. I mean, it, it is highly illegal and unlawful for an individual to be held indefinitely without any charge. Okay. It was never legal for terrorists, by the way. I'm sure a lot of you people know that. So, you know, we've got a lot of people who are aware of the, the greater truths about freedom. So it's, uh, it's despicable. With that, we got Pelosi uh, getting steeped in some family shenanigans here. Now, if you've been following the show for at least the past couple of weeks, we've been trying to cover this as much as we can. Mm -hmm. So a new report revealed that the family of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi had has had many business deals with China. This is a stark contrast from Pelosi's earlier stanch, which was critical of the Chinese Communist Party. Breitbart News senior contributor Peter Schweizer made the revelation during the January 26th edition of Jesse Waters Prime Time on Fox News. Man, I want to check that show out. I've heard it's like really popular. Um, uh, it sucks it's on Fox, but we I can't know, do it. Right, yeah. uh, you gotta judge everybody for what they do, I guess. <laughs> exactly. You know? According to the author of Ren Handed, How American Elites Get Rich Helping China Win, oh, I'll have to get that book, the House Speaker's hard anti-CCP stance gradually softened after her husband, Paul Pelosi Sr., and son, Paul Jr., started seeking deals in Beijing. Quote, Nancy Pelosi used to be pre-anti-CCP earlier in her career. And then her husband and son started seeking deals in Beijing, Schweitzer told Waters in the, letter, the, in the latter's program. Quote, last time China held the Summer Olympics in 2008, Nancy Pelosi was in favor of a boycott. And then, lo and behold, her husband was a partner in a couple of, uh, of lion, limousine companies that got major contracts in China to ferry VPs around the Olympics. The Olympics. She suddenly went from boycotting the Olympics to saying that she was opposed to a boycott for the Olympics. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. According to Swizer, Paul Pelosi Sr. was involved in two limousine firms, Global Ambassadors Concierge, GAC, and City Car Services, CCS. His Georgetown University cl classmate, Vincent Wolfton, was responsible for setting up GAC while Wolfton's son ran CCS. The House Speaker's husband had stakes in both limousine companies. So th that's just one example. Um, there's multiple different examples we can cite here. I'm not going to cover too much of it. That's the basic gist. I'll let you go ahead and do your own research on this. But I found a copy for nine bucks of that book. Oh, excellent. Great. Yeah. We'll add it to the, to the pile, the library. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, the, as we've been mentioning, the, the, the people who are career politicians not say all of them, but they often are in there to be opportunists and just take every advantage they can and not necessarily for the benefit of the people. And it's not always the ones that you know are you're, you know, you're against. Sometimes it's the ones that you think are 
not good. Right. And, you know, the, yeah, I, I won't spend too, I could comment on this because this particular <laughs> subject is just, it really fires me up. But, you know, consider the good steward parable. You know, if you're not a good steward, what happens to a, a bad steward? You know, this is what we, I think we need to be thinking of because there is a reckoning. So, um, all right, next up we got, we got rapid, rapid fire. I think you it? have one more. Uh, I think you've... so. Oh yeah, 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 okay. Um, where is it here? So yes, BLM. Oh yeah. <laughs> man, this is another one. We got a long, a lot of stuff By that I love. mansions. To... Yeah, <laughs> exactly. There's a lot of stuff I could just talk for hours about because it's just so packed with good things to learn and discover. So in this case, we've got BLM, Black Lives Matter, shuffles millions to co-founders' wife's organization, money used to purchase a massive mansion. Questions are being raised about who is doing exactly what with the millions of dollars raised by Black Lives Matter. I'm kind of curious, like, I don't know exactly how much was raised, but I think it was pushing like several hundred million dollars. A report Saturday by the New York Post says that in July, the Black Lives Matter Global Foundation Network transferred several million dollars to a group called M4BJ. The group was set in part by Gianna Khan, the wife of Black Lives Matter co-founder Patrice Khan Colors. Khan is also a co-founder of Black Lives Matter Toronto. Khan Colors stepped down from her Black Lives Matter role last year amid controversy over her purchase of multi-million dollar mansions in Georgia and Los Angeles. The money transfer was part of the cash used to buy a $6.3 million mansion, uh, formerly the headquarters of Community Party, Community Party of Canada, the Post reported. Community Party, is that like a euphemism from Communist Party? Communist yeah, Party? I don't know. Who knows? Would be surprised. Yeah. Uh, that drew some criticism. Quote from uh, quote for Black Lives Matter Canada to take money from Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation for building without consulting the community was unethical. Canadian Black Lives Matter activists Sarah Jama and Sahara Sodi said in a statement on Twitter recently, according to Fox News, quote for Black Lives Matter Canada to. Um, to refuse to answer questions from young black organizers goes against the spirit of movement building. Well, it's one kind of movement, that's for sure. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Black Lives Matter parent organization appears to be leaderless while holding an estimated 60 million in cash, according to the Washington Examiner. Okay, so I stand correct that it's not hundreds of millions, it's 60 million. Although I do think Act Blue was receiving a large portion of money as a result of the. Oh, yeah, and a lot of that money was going to Joe Biden, that's who true. signed the crime bill. Yep, exactly. So like a giant ghost ship full of treasure drifting in the night with no captain, no discernible crew, and no clear direction, Charity Watch Executive Director Lori Surin said a group, according to the examiner. The examiner report says that the address the, address the group lists on its tax forms is wrong, and two, and two supposed leaders say they have nothing to do with the group. Paul Klamer, a, a counsel for a conservative watchdog group, the National Legal Policy Center, said a full audit is called for. Quote, this is grossly irregular and improper for a nonprofit with 60 million in its coffers, Klamer said, according to the examiner. He continues, bottom line, lots of questionable financial activity, organizational structure, location of the books, et cetera, that call for a full investigation. Came Kamner, Kamner said, excuse me, guys, Kamner said raising a protest for potential fraud. Activists Makani Thimba and Monafa Bandel were picked to lead the group when Khan Colors left, but said they never did. So, um, you know, the basic gist here, as I'm sure you guys have seen, is that this money is not being properly used. Now, this is the problem because when you raise money for charity and it's not a clear directive by the people who are receiving the money, they can do kind of whatever the hell they want with it. Look at what happened with um, the Haiti situation in the Red Cross. So, so there's lots of reasons to be suspicious, but you know, I think there's enough writing on the wall to say that this whole organization and movement was, if it was started at one time for good reasons, has been so thoroughly hijacked, it's not really doing any good for anybody other than the founders and not allowing them to buy mansions. I think uh, God played a funny joke when he named her Con Colors. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> a little double, uh, you know, symbol as a reference there. Genghis Khan and Khan Job. What's funny is I think most uh, African-Americans are aware of this sort of thing compared to like, it's mostly like white, you know, mm -hmm. suburban liberals and stuff. That are... Yeah, exactly. 
All right, well, we got some rapid fire. Let's get those on the docket. So what do you, you want to take the first few? Here's some interesting news regarding uh, Pelosi and mm -hmm. Schumer. Only 20% of Dems believe that Schumer and Pelosi should remain the party leaders, which, you know, good. luckily for the other 80%, they probably won't be for much longer. That's right. <laughs> uh, this just in, uh, triple vax Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau tests positive for COVID. Mm. Conveniently, now he doesn't have to address the horrible problem happening in his country yeah, and he can get a lot of sympathy from all the, from the covid cult oh yeah and it's like you gotta get that fourth booster because yeah. look at trudeau mm -hmm. uh alan dershowitz uh biden's black female only scotus pick is likely unconstitutional that's right mm -hmm. uh and then we reported on the collapse of the bridge in pittsburgh i believe at some point last week mm -hmm. Uh, well, uh, in the wake of the bridge collapse, government redistribution of $4.2 billion in road repair resurfaces. Oh. What are the chances of that? No kidding. It's almost like they let the bridge collapse or you may possibly any other shenanigans. Well, yeah, probably. But uh, the fact that this 4.2 redistribution of funds that was supposed to go to road repair just shows up at that time. Mm. It's like, what are the chances of that if it's not intentionally being done by someone behind the exactly. scenes trying to counteract everything that's going on with this infrastructure bill? Mm -hmm. Lead, lends credence to the fact there's probably some good folks out there who knows what's going on and are trying to do something mm, about that's it. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Well, Maybe. with that, we have uh, White House confirms name of Supreme Court nominee, and that is, uh, where's she? I just saw her name a second ago. Judge Childs. Um, Michelle Childs, and she is, uh, she was, let's see, the White House has confirmed that they are considering South Carolina District Judge Michelle Childs. Okay, she's from South Carolina District. Um, Judge Childs is among multiple individuals under consideration with the Supreme Court, and I believe, I'm trying to find that part right now, that she was picked. Okay, uh, House Majority Whip James Kyburn, who pressured Joe Biden to nominate a black woman to the court before endorsing him in 2020 election, has expressed support for trials. So she was already being talked about in a scuttlebutt to name somebody for another district court position. So that's interesting. Well, you know what else is interesting? That, uh, what's it, Breyer? Mm -hmm. He didn't even know that he was retiring. He didn't know? No, they just went with it and like, oh, now you got to retire. <laughs> no way. You know, yeah. it's funny. I was thinking that because like, how easy would it be for them to say, hey, judge who was in our pocket and will blackmail you if you don't do what you say, you're going to retire, you know? He's like, what? Uh, yeah, I think his statement was, that's news to me. Like, and then, wow. you know, I think he had to kind of just like go with it because it right. just became a whole machine. Like, and then all of a sudden you had a black eye. It's kind of weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who knows, man? Who knows? But I thought that was an interesting Yeah, that, that is interesting. Um. I don't, I think you already mentioned the Dershowitz one. Oh uh, yeah, my bad, I didn't know. No, it's okay. Um, so there's that. So in response, a follow-up to that, Dershowitz is essentially suggesting that if the basis for the nomination is the, her skin color and sex, and that is unconstitutional, and it is. The unconstitution, correct me if I'm wrong, explicitly just refers to merit, at least in a general sense. And again, I'd like to stress that we would love to see a black woman on the Supreme Court but we need it to be someone who's qualified and not a strategic choice who's being picked because she's going to play ball with the political elite. Bingo. Exactly. Spot on. And for our last um, uh, rapid fire, we got a shock poll. 50% of U.S. voters believe Biden should be impeached, including 50% of black voters. <laughs> which is, All right. Yikes, that's pretty, that's a lot of, of uh, people there, right there. Your days are over, mister. Yeah, exactly. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That's the news for today. Big week. We got lots of things coming here in the next week. Yeah. Uh, uh, we have an interview with uh, some friends from Journey to Truth coming up. And that's right. So that'll be tomorrow. I think they're doing a pre record. Yeah. The pre record. Okay. So that'll be a coming up in the next few days. And we just confirmed we're going to have um, Clay Clark on next week. So we'll release that as soon as it's ready to go. So big stuff. Well, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to check the, the links in the description. Like, share, and subscribe to this video. I'll see you on the next one.